Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. I'm Jason Miller. Tonight on the Evan Miller Report, we have breaking news that the California Senate as they approve SB 277 unexpectedly this morning. We have the latest details in a report tonight. Also on tonight's program, you, the U.S. accuses Russia of violating the Ukrainian troops between the two countries. We have the latest on the, on the conflict in the region. Nigeria begins a Sabasha ground offensive as they wrap up the wrap up in the last known hideouts of Boko Haram militants. And in France, police arrest a man planning to attack churches. We have all those stories and more, plus the latest on the UK elections on tonight's Evan Miller Report here on the SHR Media Network. Plus, there's Corey Evan. Thank you, Jay. I was wondering when you would get to me. Japanese Premier Shinzo Abe proves once and for all that he's not really sorry about World War II. A former Iowa lawmaker is acquitted of spousal abuse, but is he really innocent? I have no idea. Oil is greasing up the stock markets today, stealing some thunder from Comcast, as deserved. In lawsuits, the Boy Scouts are feeling the tenderfoot tingle, as I like to call it. And Jay actually spotted this. One Full House star was caught off guard by the upcoming reboot. That's all coming up in your conservative news source. The Evan Mill Report starts now. Live from Southern California, this is the Evan Miller Report. Jason Miller with news and politics. Corey Evan with business and entertainment. This is the Evan Miller Report on SHR Media and Hundred Press Radio. Here now, Jason Miller. And a very good evening on this Wednesday, April the twenty second, twenty fifteen. I'm Jason Miller, along with Corey Evan this evening. And my goodness, Corey, it looks like we may be getting some rain finally here in Southern California. This yes, it's about California. time. Yes, absolutely need that rain around here. And yes, I was joking about it earlier. I know we got a lot of stuff to get to today. Absolutely right. Before we get to the start of tonight's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't often get things wrong on this program. But occasionally, I do. I stated in yesterday's broadcast that Lori Laughlin was going to be on the KTLA 5 morning show this morning. I happen to be wrong. She was on the KTLA 5 morning show yesterday. And apparently, the email that I had received happened to have video from that interview. So what we will be doing, will be airing the audio in Lori Laughlin's response to that new Full House reboot later in the entertainment report. But I, as a newsman, would like to apologize for misguiding you, especially for our folks who live in Southern California wanting to turn their TVs on this morning and expecting to see Lori Laughlin. Well, they didn't see Lori Laughlin, did they? So, yeah, that's how I feel sometimes. Don't worry, man. I'm sure folks will forgive you in time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just regret the error. And at that point, we're going to move on for the rest of the broadcast here for this because we do have breaking news coming out of the Sacramento Capitol tonight. A California Senate committee has approved AB 277, the, a, the bill that would require California school children to be vaccinated. You remember us bringing this story to you last week on the Evan Miller Report. The Senate Education Committee voted 7-2 to today on the bill by Senator Richard Pant, a Democratic pediatrician from Sacramento, with votes from both Democrats and Republicans. Boy, would I like to know who those Republicans are. The proposal would eliminate California's personal belief and religious exemptions, so unvaccinated children would not be able to attend public or private schools. Medical waivers would only be available for children who have health problems. Lawmakers delayed a vote on the bill last week, as we reported, after some on the committee worried it would deprive unvaccinated children from receiving an adequate education. 
Hundreds of opponents again failed the committee room for Wednesday's vote. The bill now heads to the Senate Judiciary Committee for a hearing next week, the next step before this bill might be passed. The bill that says it would eliminate the option California parents use to skip their child's school immunizations faces a do-or-die test in a state Senate committee that came close to rejecting it last week. The bill's authors made two amendments in an effort to win committee support. One allows unvaccinated children to be homeschooled with non-family or non-household members, and the other allows students in recognized independent study programs to skip required vaccinations. Senators Richard Pan, as we mentioned before, and Ben Allen, Democrat from Santa Monica here in Southern California, did not incorporate a religious exemption into the bill, but said they were open to doing so. The senators were concerned that losing the proposed restrictions will not accomplish the goal of driving up immunization rates to protect the greater public. Religious exemptions, which are allowed in 46 states here in the United States, are sometimes used by parents who simply do not want their children immunized. There's even a website that tells parents how to legally claim a religious exemption, even if they're not religious. Under California law, parents who don't want their children immunized as otherwise required to enroll in school can simply cite personal belief to opt out after obtaining a health care provider's signature as proof they received information about immunizations if the personal belief is due to religion. Parents do not need a doctor's signature. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's a disturbing fact, because as soon as we allow this to go here in the state of California, so goes the parental rights of everyone here in the United States. So a very disturbing, disturbing story coming out of Sacramento tonight. We'll keep you posted as it's just moving on to the next committee, but it's not looking good, ladies and gentlemen, if it got out of that first committee and is going into this next committee, as we reported as the Senate Judiciary Committee for a hearing next week. We'll keep you posted on the latest coming out with that. All right, on to the international news tonight. The U.S. has accused Russia of deploying more air defense systems in eastern Ukraine in a breach of a ceasefire deal. The State Department also said Russia was involved in training separatist forces in the area and building up its forces along the border. The Kremlin has not yet responded to the claims. A truce between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian rebels in East Ukraine was brokered by the West in Minsk back in February. Ukraine accuses Russia of arming the rebels and sending Russian troops over the border, a claim which Moscow dis denies. State Department spokeswoman and BS artist Maria Harp said in a statement that combined Russian separatist forces were violating the terms of the Minsk deal, keeping artillery and multiple rocket launchers in prohibited areas. The Russian military has deployed additional air defense systems into eastern Ukraine and moved several of those nearer the front line, she said. This is the highest amount. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Let me go ahead and mute that as I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. Little. Uh, background noise, and that was not my phone, that was someone else's phone here in the newsroom, so my apologies. Corey, turn your phone off. Hey, don't blame me for your studio's offices ringing off the hook. Hmm. It, wa it was Lori Laughlin. She didn't, she didn't like your description of her during your teaser. Hi there. Well, get him. All right, back to the uh, back to the story here on the program. Ms. Harp said the increasingly complex nature of training of pro-Russian forces in East Ukraine leaves no doubt that Russia is involved. Russia is also building up its forces along its border with Ukraine, she said. After maintaining a relatively steady presence along the border, Russia is sending additional units there. Though these forces will give Russia its largest presence on the border since October of 2014. Sorry about the noise there once again, ladies and gentlemen. Over to Nigeria that now, folks, where ground troops have joined an offensive on the last known hideout of the Boko Haram Islamic militants, according to a military spokesperson speaking to the BBC. 
the vast northeastern Syrian Sabasha forest is where they have many bases, and it has been subject to an aerial bombardment since February. There has been speculation that some of the Chinabok schoolgirls kidnapped more than a year ago are still being held there. Boko Haram, of course, has killed thousands of northern Nigerian in northern Nigeria since 2009. Nigeria's military, backed by troops from neighboring countries, lodged an offensive against Boko Haram in February and has recaptured most of the territory the militants had taken in the previous year. Over to France, where French police have arrested a man suspected of planning an attack on one of two churches in the, a Paris suburb, according to the country's interior minister. Siad Ahmed Gehain, a 24-year-old Algerian national, was detained on Sunday in Paris after he apparently shot himself by accident and called an ambulance. He is also being questioned over the murder of a woman on Sunday. France has stepped up security in the wake of recent attacks uh, on the Charlie Hebdo offices and Jewish supermarket earlier this year. Galam was known to security forces as expressed a wish to travel to Syria to fight with Danish militants, according to French's interior minister, uh, Berard Castaf said. When the police arrived at the scene on Sunday, they followed a trail of blood to the suspect's car where they found weapons and notes on potential targets. The documents established beyond doubt that Gillenham planned on attacking churches in France, said Mr. Cahaz, uh, said Mr. Kambasi. Several war weapons, including handguns, ammunition, and bulletproof vests, were also found in his car and home, the minister added. Documents linked to Al-Qaeda and Denise were also found at his apartment, according to the Par Paris prosecutor Francis Molnos. A contact in Syria had advised Gillingham to target churches, he added. The authorities have carried out security checks on the suspect twice in recent years, but did not uncover anything to justify any further investigation until this past week. At least 15 young Western women who joined Danish and married jihadi fighters are now widows after the militant group suffered losses in clashes in Syria and Iraq. This, according to researchers who closely monitor Islamic radicals online. The Institution, uh, Institute for Strategic Dialogue think tank in London gave Reuters and ITN access to its database of 106 foreign women it says it moved to ISIS or Danish territory and are actively online. Fifteen of the women have either mentioned on social media that they lost their husbands in fighting or other known Danish supporters have announced the men's death online, said, uh, said the ISD researcher Melaine Smith. Although Reuters and ITN could not independently confirm the identities of the women, many of them have been said by relatives to have left their home countries for Syria and Iraq. Some have also been named by law enforcement officials in their countries or leave online traces such as having geographical locations on their Twitter accounts. To Sri Lanka, where Basil Raspaka, the younger brother of Sri Lanka's former president, Miklata Raspiska has been arrested on corruption charges. He served as a minister for economic development under his brother. He has also been accused, alongside with two other men, of misappropriation of state funds in a construction case. Malani Rancha, who also faces corruption claims, along with other another brother, Kaltalta, says he and his family are the victims of a witch hunt. His successor as president... Uh, Metha Sharska was elected back in January on a pledge to fight corruption. Basil Ruska was brought before a magistrate in Colombo on Wednesday. To Australia now, where at least four people have died in New South Wales as violent storms continue to batter the Australian state. A 86-year-old woman was killed in the central Hunter region when her car was swept into floodwaters, according to police. Two men and a woman were found dead in Dugnog, north of Sydney, one of the worst affected areas where homes have been washed away by flooding. Dugnog was among 12 communities declared a natural disaster area on Wednesday by emergency services. Residents in the capital, Sydney, have been urged to evacuate after days of heavy rain have put more than 200 homes in the southwest of the city under threat from rising water level, or river levels. Excuse me. Officials say the fierce weather will continue for at least another day, with the Bureau of Meteorology warning that a second storm cell was gathering 
at a sea north of Sydney. And, no, uh, and Corey Evan was right sending that message in. It's not such a great day for those mates over in Australia. We are in our prayers, mates. Staying in the region, New Zealand's Prime Minister John Kay has apologized to a woman who works at an Auckland cafe for repeatedly pulling her hair. Wait a minute. When did the when did uh, men pulling schoolgirls' hairs get into my news headlines? Kari? <laughs> what? I didn't. Do, I've never pulled a girl's hair in my life, ever. You've been, you've been watching too much iCarly on Nickelodeon again. What's the matter with you? The unnamed waitress wrote in a blog that he had tugged her ponytail on several occasions, even after she had asked him not to. Mr. Key's office said on Wednesday that his actions were meant to be lighthearted, and he apologized. The incident had sparked criticism from an opposition party and the public, and our very own Corey Evan. The waitress wrote on the Daily Blog that the hair pulling started during last year's November election campaign when Mr. Key's National Party was re-elected. She said that she had begun avoiding him whenever he came into the cafe and had told his security officers that she didn't like her hair being pulled. She finally told Mr. Key in person to stop in March, but he continued to do so. He then later apologized and gave the waitress two personalized bottles of wine. Well, ladies and gentlemen, corruption seems abound in New Zealand. Instead of apologizing, he pays her off with wine. My goodness wants her to dr drink away her fearful memories of that hair pulling. My goodness must be bringing, out, bringing back those poor days she had to go through through elementary school. Sounds about right. Mm, wow, disturbing, disturbing indeed. Matter of fact, I'm just going to come out and say it. The New Zealand Prime Minister, John Key, should be ashamed of himself. Shame on you, sir. Okay, thank you very much for that. An Australian wellness blogger who built a successful business on claims she survived terminal cancer has admitted she never had the disease. None of it's true, Belly Gibson told Australian Women's Weekly magazine in an interview. Miss Gibson chronicled her battle with cancer on a blog. Supposedly, the whole pantry would spawn an app and recite book. But doubts after her claim surfaced after she failed to deliver a promised $300,000 donation to charity. I'm still jumping between what I think I know and what is reality, Miss Gibson said in the interview, her first since the story was called into question. She continued to say, I have lived it and I'm not really there yet, she said. Miss Gibson rose to prominence in 2013 after claiming she was treating her magnolian brain cancer with whole foods and alternate therapies. She went on to build a huge following on social media for her recites and so-called wellness tips. But when pressed to show medical records to back up her story, she refused. She said, quote, I don't want forgiveness, adding that speaking out because it was the responsible thing to do. Above anything, I would like to people to say, okay, she's human. Miss Gibson's recite book was withdrawn by Penguin Books back in March, and her app was removed by Apple from its online store. Again, I say, shame on, the, on these bloody blokes over here who are trying trying to be somebody they're not. They're a lot of idiots. Shameful, to say the Shameful. least. Shameful. It's worse than watching an episode of Jimmy Kimmel on Friday night. What's wrong with Friday night Jimmy Kimmel? That's when they air all the reruns. Ah, that's right. Yeah, it's all about Thursday night, the unnecessary censorship. That's my favorite uh, segment Yes, it certainly is. All right, we're getting off track here slightly. Let's get try to get back on. Supermarket giant Tesco in the UK has reported a bottom line loss of $6.38 billion for the year to February the 28th, the biggest annual loss in its history. This part of international business news tonight. Chief Executive Dave Lewis, who had instigated a turnaround plan at the supermarket since taking over in August of last year, said Tesco had endured a very difficult year, but was seeking to draw a line under the past. And, of course, we'll keep you up to date with the latest here on that. And there is an interview that Dave Lewis did with ITV News, and we'll post that up on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash 
the Evan Miller Report for our international listeners who tune into this program for their listening pleasure. UK election news now. Well, SNP, former SNP Prime Minister Alex Salmon has said his suggestion he would be writing Labour's budget if it won power in May was meant as a lighthearted remark. The ex-Scottish minister was filmed making the joke at an SNP fundraising event on April the 13th. The video was then tweeted by David Cameron, who said voters would be shocked, but Mr. Salmon said the Prime Minister clearly had a sense of humor bypass. Nothing to do with heart issues, just to be clear. That's the British sense of humor talking, ladies and gentlemen. Labor dismissed the suggestion of any SNP influence as, quote, total nonsense. When the polls pointing to another hung parliament, there is much more focus and debate on possible coalitions and deals between the parties to form a government. The Conservatives are warming of a Labour SNP tie-up, which they say would cause chaos and be bad for the United Kingdom. Although Labour leader and BS artist, in my opinion, Ed Miliband, has ruled out a former coalition with the Scottish National Party, also known as the NSNP. If his party falls short of a majority on May the 7th, the Conservatives say there could be a loser arrangement with Labour relying on the SNP support to win Commons votes. In reply, Mr. Miliband has accused the Conservative Party of putting the future of the UK at rest by, quote, talking up rather than taking on the SNP. In, foot, in video footage recorded by a cell phone, apparently, Mr. Salmon says, quote, the Scottish leader will not be writing the Labour Party budget. But then I knew that already because I'm writing the Labour Party budget to many la uh, lighthearted laughter inside the auditorium he was speaking. Mr. Salmon said that the point made in a lighthearted way was that the Scottish Labour leader Jim Murphy had been slapped down by his party bosses at Westminster and told that he would have no role in a Labour budget. David Cameron is clearly a Prime Minister with both a people bypass and a sense of humor bypass, says Mr. Salmon. In his tweet, David Cameron said, quote, This footage will shock you. Alex Salmon laughs and boasts he'll write Labour's budget. Vote Conservative to stop it. The video of Mr. Salmon was raised during Wednesday's daily politics debate on the economy. Labor's Treasury spokesman Chris Leslie said the SNP would have no influence on a Labor budget. It's total nonsense, he said. Why would we tie up in a way with the SNP when we disagree so profoundly with them on the need to make sure we have fiscal responsibility? To him, that independent economic think tank, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, has said Labour's plans are broadly consistent with the SNP's. He disagreed. He said to the BBC's economics editor, Robert Peston, quote, If you think that Stewart's proposal for additional borrowing is something that we would go along with, you're completely wrong. And, ladies and gentlemen, that is the latest on the UK election news tonight. Stay with SHR Media and the Evan Miller Report for the latest on the British elections. On May the 7th, we'll bring you the very latest in regards to the British elections. And our coverage starts at 1 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific, starting on May the 6th, right here on SHR Media. All right, one more international story on my end before I send it over to Corey Evan for the latest out of Asia tonight. The India has taken out the... Arab, te Arab television channel Al Jazeera, as me and Corey like to call, and let's go ahead and do it together for the audience's sake. Al Jazeera television. Quality Arab television. And Dead, to, Dead America. to America. Thank you very much. Now back to the story. Al Jazeera, that quality Arab television in Debt to America, was ta uh, taken off the air for five days, claiming that it had shown wrong maps of Kashmir. The news channel showed a blue screen on Wednesday with a sign saying it will not be available until Monday. India says maps used by the channel are incorrect as they show the region of Kashmir is divided between Pakistan, India, and China. Kashmir is claimed by both India and Pakistan in its entirety but has effectively been divided since 1948. Failure to agree on the status of the territory by diplomatic means has brought India and Pakistan to war on a number of occasions and has agitated agitated an insurgency in Indian and Mr. Kashmir. Maps approved by the Indian government still show the entirety of the former princely state as lying with Indian control, while other maps seek to show the de facto border between areas administered by India and Pakistan. 
The message said on that blue screen, as instructed by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, this channel will not be available from certain hours on the 22nd of April until the 27th of April. On Wednesday, Al Jazeera programs in India were replaced by the sign, as I stated, saying the channel will not be available until the 27th. 7th. The channel's bureau chief in India, Amol Sekska, was quoted by the AFP news agency as saying the channel has made reparations to the ministry and was hopeful of having the order revoked. Ladies and gentlemen, my honest opinion, ladies and gentlemen, if India wants to, I certainly wish they keep Al Jazeera television, quality Arab television, and debt to America off Indian television. Because they talk nothing about debt to America. And I'm right or am I right, core? Yeah. Jay, because I've never heard anything pro-American out of Al Jazeera as of yet. Mm, never have. All right, Corey Evan. It, it now is going to wrap up the international news tonight, and he has an update in Japan. And apparently, Corey, the Japanese Prime Minister is glad that World War II happened. Tell us more. Maybe not particularly glad, but the leaders of China and Japan met to Wednesday local time for only the second time since taking office, but the effort to repair badly damaged ties was marred after Prime Minister Shinzo Abe earlier failed to apologize for Tokyo's wartime aggression. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Japan's Abe met on the sidelines of a summit in the Indonesia capital Jakarta for about 30 minutes, seeking to fix a relationship damaged by territorial disputes and a bitter wartime legacy. Shaking hands before the talks started, the two men looked more relaxed than at their meeting at a summit last November in China, where they shared an awkward ha handshake. Following the talks, Abe, whose strident nationalism has caused much friction with Beijing, told reporters the, leading, the leaders had a very meaningful summit meeting, and relations between China and Japan were improving. But a speech by Abe at the summit earlier Wednesday, in which failed to apologize for Japan's World War II rampage through Asia, cast a shadow over the talks, with Xi afterwards referring to historical issues. A commentary on Beijing's official Xinhua news agency said the meeting was a positive sign, but added Abe's failure to apologize was deeply regrettable, and Tokyo's treacherous stance on the sensitive historical issues was holding back the relationship. Beijing and Tokyo's historical, horse, histor historically frosty relations, I'm starting to freeze up over this one, have plunged to their lowest level in decades over competing claims to Japanese-controlled islets in the East China Sea, and China viewed that Abe is not sufficiently repentant for Japan's 20th century wartime aggression. In Abe's speech to the gathering of Asian and African leaders, he expressed deep remorse, but did not make a heartfelt apology or refer to colonial rule and aggression, failing to echo the language of a landmark 1995 statement on Japanese wartime behavior. Stay with us here at the Evan Miller Report. I will bring you the latest updates on Japan and China's Sino-Japanese relations as they become available. Coming back into the U.S., oh, actually, I've got one from Pro Pope Francis's desk to the New York Times. Pope Francis will visit Cuba later this year, stopping there on his way to the U.S., the Vatican said today. Francis's two immediate predecessors each made a papal visit to Cuba, John Paul II in 1998 and Benedict XVI in 2012. Vatican Radio said that the planned visit was, quote, especially significant in light of the role played by Pope Francis in diplomatic negotiations between the U.S. and Cuba, which produced an agreement in December to ease tensions and restore diplomatic relations after decades of animosity. This month in Panama, the presidents of the U.S. and Cuba met face-to-face -face for the first time in more than 50 years. Take that, Fidel Castro, I guess. But on that note, we must go to break. But when we return... Comcast is making bold claims in their statement to the antitrust officers, but are they writing a check their tushies can't cash? A Northern California BSA chapter, Boy Scouts of America chapter that is, is getting sued over sex abuse claims in today's lawsuits across America. And guess who's been voted the most beautiful woman in Hollywood? You'll find all that out, plus, Jason Miller. Thank you very much, Corey. Coming up in the... Uh, DC News tonight. The man who shot former president and late Ronald Reagan is up for a possibility of parole. 
and wants him released, according to his lawyer. Also tonight, we have our uh, we uh, have our bi-monthly Supreme Court brief here on the Evan Miller Report tonight, including judges being skeptical about raisin farms and jo uh, dogs sniffing for drugs. Plus, in the DC news tonight, we talk about the cyber security bill in, uh, in clearing the U.S. House over to the Senate. We have all those stories and more, plus Lori Laughlin's response to the new full house returning to Netflix when we return on the SHR Media Network. You're listening to the Evan Miller Report. We'll be right back. Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. How you doing? John Grant here. When I'm not slaving over a hot microphone on the 405radio.com Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern, I check out Sean and Clint here at Sackheads Radio. We all appreciate the best political bloggers, writers, and commentators. We either get them on our shows or we make fun of them, as it should be. So check us out live Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern or forever on the podcasts on the 405radio.com. This is Tammy Jackson inviting you to join me on the Tammy Jackson Show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Pacific on the 405radio.com. Put down that remote and tune into the show that covers politics, guns in the Second Amendment, religious liberty, sanctity of life, the military, and more. I host newsworthy guests and work hard to be a conservative radio show that's not like all the others. So save Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific for me, Tammy Jackson, on the 405media.com. Hello, I'm Paul, a student at Hillsdale College. Here is my professor, Dr. Larry Arn, on the separation of church and state. America's founders believed in the separation of church and state, in that the country was not to have an official religion or an official sect. But that did not mean that government was to be hostile to religion, or even indifferent to religion, as many today argue. In fact, America's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, includes both a reference to God as the author of the laws of nature and a confident assertion that human beings are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Far from being hostile or indifferent to religion, America's founders understood the theology of the Declaration to be an essential part of the education of citizens. This Constitution Minute was brought to you by Hillsdale College. To join the national conversation on the Constitution, go to constitutionminute.org. Hi, this is Rooster from Outcry Radio. Catch me here on Blog Talk Radio every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or follow my blog. At Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network. Hey, y'all. Cedric the Entertainer here with Niecy Nash, taking a break from shooting the soul man to introduce you to Patience. Hi. Patience is a patient at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Families never receive a bill from St. Jude for anything because all a family should worry about is helping their child live. St. Jude won't give up until they end childhood cancer, sickle cell, and other deadly diseases. Because of you, there is St. Jude. Learn more at stjude.org. There are more than 3 million children in America's child protective and justice systems. Kids have been abused, neglected, or traumatized. Kids who have begun to act out. The worst situations you can imagine. They've been told repeatedly they're worthless, messed up, or written off completely as a lost cause. For their safety and others, some of these children have to be removed from their homes, separated from their families. They're at the mercy of an overwhelmed system. Every 38 minutes, another troubled child is referred to youth villages. Youth Villages believes that no child is a lost cause, not a single one, because a stable, loving family can help any child succeed. 
And we have an 80% overall success rate that proves doing whatever it takes for children is the only thing that works. If you agree, find out how you can help at youthvillages.org. And for the first time, the jury was shown large, vibrant pictures of the four people killed in the Boston and Miller Report. This is from the Gloucestershire Times. Then prosecutors pulled out the photo they saved for last. Joe Garcernev giving the finger to the security camera in his jail cell that I mentioned yesterday. The penalty phase in the Boston Marathon Bombers trial opened in dramatic fashion yesterday with prosecutors portraying Sarnev as a cold-blooded killer and America's worst nightmare. The government then began trying to drive home the horror of the attack by calling to the stand witnesses who lost legs or loved ones in the April 15, 2013 bombing. Several jurors shed tears as the father of Crystal Campbell, a 29-year-old restaurant manager killed in the bombing, daughter Princess. He wiped away tears with a handkerchief, his growing horse as he described how she wasn't really a girly girl and preferred baseball over other activities. Campbell described a heartbreaking mix-up that led his family to believe that Crystal had survived the bombing and was undergoing surgery. One of the doctors asked Campbell to take a walk with him to go see Crystal in her room. Quote, it wasn't Crystal. I passed out on the floor, Campbell said. I couldn't remember anything after that until I woke up at about five minutes later and I realized that Crystal was gone and they made a mistake. <clears throat> Earlier Tuesday, prosecutors showed the jury a photo of a wounded Crystal writhing in anger agony on the ground, her mouth agape. Jillian Rennie told the jury she was an 18-year-old high school senior when she went to, to watch her sister run her first marathon. She said the first blast knocked her to the ground, and when she looked down, she could see her legs were covered in blood, and a bone that had snapped in half was sticking out. And it does get gruesome from there. Slouching in his seat at the defense table as usual, Sarnayev stared straight ahead and showed no reaction during the proceedings. He did not appear to look at any of the witnesses. <sighs> Glad to see that he's still in the same form, isn't he, Jay? And on that note, I'll go ahead and send it over to you because you've got an equally unrepentant man trying to get out of jail early. Yes, someone's trying to get him a jail out of free car. Thank you, Corey. A lawyer for the man who shot President Ronald Reagan has told a court his client should be permanently released from his mental health hospital. This from the BBC. John Hickley Jr. shot the president who survived and three others outside the Hilton Hotel in Washington back in 1981. Mr. Hickley was found not guilty by reason of insanity but was sent for treatment to a Washington hospital. Currently he spent 17 days per month at his mother's home in a nearby state of Virginia. Mr. Hickley's lawyer Barry Levine told a federal court on Wednesday that the would-be assassin is clinically ready to leave St. Elizabeth's Hospital permanently because he has been in full and stable remission for more than two decades. The lawyer is asking a judge to grant his client convalescent leave, which would allow him to live outside the hospital with regular visits to mental health professionals. But prosecutor Colleen Kennedy disagreed and said more restrictions and conditions are necessarily are necessary. Excuse me to keep Mr. Hickley and others safe. You see how this story's affecting me, ladies and gentlemen. It ticks me off that this lawyer's trying to pull this. His mother is 89 years old and lives near Williamsburg, Virginia. While living with her, he is allowed to live a normal life that includes unsupervised shopping and dining out and occasional contact with the U.S. Secret Service. Mr. Uh, Mr. Reagan, or President Reagan, as we should be calling him, sorry about that in this report, was just 69 days into his presidency when the attempt was made on his life. The former president suffered a punctured lung, but then survived after being rushed to a nearby hospital. Three others were wounded, including White House aide James Brady, who was shot in the head and suffered brain damage and partial paralysis. A Secret Service agent and police officer also suffered lesser wounds. Uh, the shooting wa was uh, was the made the ways for a gun control law to be passed in 1993 and was nicknamed the Brady Bill and the White House press briefing room now bears Brady's name. Brady died in August of last year at the age of 73.
All right, Corey Evans got the business news today. I bet U.S. markets did take that news out of the U.K. Corey, regarding Festo, uh, too well today. Kinda weighed on it. Only modest gains. The Dow gained 88 points at 18038. The Nasdaq 21 points up at 5035, and the S&P 500 picked up 10 points at 2107. Oil futures, what were what weighed on the market as well? They settled lower today after a U.S. government report showed crude supplies rose for a 15th week in a row, but domestic output slipped and gasoline inventories fell more than expected. On the New York Mercantile Exchange, June crude fell 45 cents or 0.8 percent to settle at 56.16 a barrel. It was trading at around 56 and a dime shortly before the supply data and topped 57 immediately after them. June Brent crude on London's ICE Futures Exchange tacked on a 65 cents to 62.73 a barrel. Early Wednesday, the U.S. Energy Information Administration reported another increase in crude supplies, but data also showed that gasoline inventories fell more than expected. NYMEX prices had reversed losses immediately after the inventory report as production ticked lower for a second consecutive week, but crude inventories still saw a solid build as refinery utilization fell and imports increased, said Matt Smith, commodity analyst at Schneider Electric. Crude inventories rose 5.3 million barrels for the week ended April 17th. That's about double the 2.6 million barrel increase analysts polled by Platt's forecast, but less than 5.5 million barrel rise reported late Tuesday by the American Petroleum Institute. Domestic crude oil production fell by around 18,000 barrels, with output still up roughly 13.5% year-on-year, according to Tim Evans at City Futures. The decline in output, however, encouraged market expectations that recent declines in the number of U.S. rigs actively drilling for oil are finally impacting production levels. Chicago-based Boeing, on the matter of transportation, delivered more airplanes in the first quarter, offsetting sluggish results in the defense side of its business and pushing first quarter profit beyond expectations, the company said to the Chicago Tribune today. Earnings were up 38 percent, topping Wall Street. The company said profits were $1.34 billion, or $1.87 a share. Excluding $113 million in pension expenses, the company said adjusted profit was $1.97 a share, beating the $1.81 forecast by analysts surveyed by Zach's Investment Research. A year earlier, adjusted profit was $1.76 a share. Like in recent quarters, it was a tale of Boeing's two different business segments. Earnings from commercial airplanes, accounting for two-thirds of profits and sales, rose 8%, and defense and space business declined with earnings down 4% as tight defense budgets cut into sales. And the Justice Department antitrust officials who are meeting with Comcast representatives today to air their concerns about the proposed tie-up with Time Warner aren't likely to entertain promises that the merged company would change its behavior to win approval. The leadership at the... Mm, Antitrust division would rather see the number one U.S. cable company sell assets to keep the market competitive or will file a lawsuit that uh, will block a deal that hurts consumers, according to people familiar with the officials thinking. This view departs from the U.S. antitrust division's position in it. In a court that allowed Comcast to agree to a string of so-called behavior remedies to buy NBC Universal. Now, antitrust lawyers reviewing the proposed 45... $2 $2 billion deal to buy Time Warner are looking at whether Comcast complied with terms of the NBCU agreement. In particular, the officials are looking at whether Comcast honored a promise not to interfere with management of online video service Hulu, according to people with knowledge of the matter. Hulu is one-third owned by the cable company. As Comcast executives and Justice Department officials meet a day after a group of U.S. senators ask the department to block the merger, saying it would harm customers, the question is, what will it take for Comcast to secure approval. With this meeting, the review process enters a new phase, a dance where each side seeks to bolster its negotiating position to get the best deal. The Justice Department has filed antitrust suits that ultimately were resolved with settlements, including Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Envy's purchase of Grupo Modelo, and American Airlines Group's merger with U.S. Airways in 2013. My hope in all of this, Jay, is that the combined company will eventually spend some degree of money on improving customer service because you've seen some of the videos of people posting up their awful experiences with Comcast customer service, Comcast oh, yeah. representatives.
asking oh, a customer, sure. why don't you want the best customer? Why don't you want the best cable in the industry? And another video that I saw, and I'll send this to you, Jay, if you want, but one customer actually posted up actual footage of their cell phone keeping track of how long they were on hold before the customer service desk shut down. Mm. Wow. Certainly amazing. And what I'm hoping to see in this, that Time Warner cable, if bought by Comcast, will actually start broadcasting Dodge of Baseball to the people in Greater Los Angeles. Oh, yes. I should have thought you would say something about that. I, it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous that Time Warner will not negotiate with the likes of the satellite companies, whether it be DirecTV, Dish Network, or its cable rival, at least here in Southern California by standards, AT&T, U-verse, and, of course, by the lower likes of what we like to call Verizon. Yeah, and I only get Verizon where I live. I can't get Time Warner, so... Hurry up and negotiate something, guys. Best of luck on that. All right, Corey Evan, he had the business news. Thank you very much for that. Moving on to our Supreme Court brief, and it is going to be brief due to time tonight. The Supreme Court had arguments today about the government's power to confiscate raisin crops. Several justices appeared to relish the chance to make a few remarks about a complicated subject. The case of Horn versus Department of Articulture was back before the nine justices for a second time. Back in 2013, several justices had a field day making comments about the premise that the government can use in order to force farmers to give up parts of their crop in order to control supplies and prices. Your raisins are your life, right? You don't have to pay the penalty if you give us the raisins. Justice Anthony Scalia asked in 2013 about fines imposed on raisin farmers who balked at the order. Meanwhile, Justice Alaya Kagan said back in 2013 that the case needed to go back to the appeals court so it could tr- uh, try to figure out whether the marketing order is a taking or it's just the world's most outdated law. And that is where the case went before it returned to the court on Wednesday after the Horns lost again in the appeals court. The court is considering a complicated three-part question, and we'll have that three-part question up on our Facebook page Facebook.com forward slash The Evan Miller Report for your viewing pleasure. A motorist pulled over for a traffic violation may not be detained by police longer than necessary for the officer to issue a ticket or warning for the alleged driving infraction. This coming from the Supreme Court yesterday. In a 6-3 to three decision, the High Court said the police may not continue to detain a driver and passengers during a roadside traffic stop to facilitate an additional investigation, such as a sniff of the vehicle by a drug-related detention dog. We hold that a police stop exceeding the time needed to handle the matter for which the stop was made violates the Constitution's shield against unreasonable seizures, said Justice Ruth Gator Ginsburg, who, who wrote in the majority opinion. And that's your Supreme Court brief. Now to the D.C. news, where the U.S. House of Representatives today passed a bill aimed at improving the sharing of information about cybersecurity threats between the government and the private sector. The measure, which passed on a 307 to 116 vote, will give President Obama's administration most of what it sought, but the bill has raised objections from the likes of several liberties activists. Obama has been for years seeking a cybersecurity bill that allows companies to share information on threats without fear of liability. But some activists argue that the bill encroaches on civil liberties in its bid to improve cybersecurity. Other D.C. news making headlines today. Weeks before a key surveillance law expires, Senate Republicans have introduced a bill that would allow the NSA to continue collecting the call records of nearly every American. The measure by Majority Leader and BS Artist Mitch McConnell and Intelligence Committee Chairman and BS Artist Richard Burr would bypass Senate committees and reauthorizes sections of the Patriot Act, the worst act in history, I think. Back to the story, though, including the provision of which under the NSA is requiring phone companies to turn over to and from records of the most domestic landline calls. After the program was disclosed back in 2013 by former NSA contractor Edward Snowden, President Obama and many lawmakers called for legislation to end that collection, but a bill to do so failed last year. Proponents had hoped that the expiration of the Patriot Act provisions on June the 1st of this year would force consideration of such a measure. 
And finally, before we wrap it up and send it over for tonight's lawsuits across America, a Republican-led committee investigating the 2012 attacks on Americans in Benghazi, Libya, and former Secretary of State and presidential candidate Hillary Clinton's role is signaling that its final report could slip to just months before the presidential election if the Obama administration delays producing documents and witnesses. A spokesperson for Representative Trey Gowdy of South Carolina, who's the chairman of the Benghazi panel, said today that Gowdy still hopes to complete the committee's work by the end of this year, but said factors we don't control could delay the report, including a lack of responsiveness by the administration. Gowdy wants this done by the end of the year, said spokesman Jamil Ware, but factors including witnesses' availability, compliance with document requests, and security clearances could continue to impact the timing of the increase conclusion. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, that is, that is tonight's uh, report from D.C. Now it's time for tonight's lawsuits across America. And now it's time for lawsuits across America. The cases are real. All rise for the Honorable Corey Evans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit, sit, sit. We got to get through this right away. The local Boy Scouts of America organization in Sacramento, California, according to the Sacramento Bee, was hit with a lawsuit this week after an adult assistant scoutmaster was found to have sexually abused a minor Eagle Scout. During a news conference Tuesday, the Eagle Scout, a 17-year-old from Chico, referred into the lawsuit to in the lawsuit only as John Doe, spoke out about the ordeal and urged the other childhood sexual assault victims to come forward. His attorney, Joseph C. George of Sacramento, declined to disclose the victim's name because he's a minor. The perpetrator, Justin Hedrick, was 21 and 22 at the time he sexually assaulted John in 2010 and 2012, according to the lawsuit filed Monday in Sacramento Superior Court. George said Hedrick made repeated sexual overtures via social media during that period. Yuck. And the battle for the skies above the Hamptons is headed for a courtroom. This out of New York, according to ABC News, a group representing helicopter operators has sued, claiming new laws restricting flights at East Hamptons Town Airport are unconstitutional. The town enacted the laws last week to address tens of thousands of complaints it's received about noise from planes and helicopters shutting the rich and famous into the Hamptons, particularly during the summer. Supervisor Larry Cantwell has, has said the town received 24,000 Twenty-four and a half thousand complaints, to be exact, about airport-related noise last year, nearly quadrupling the 6,700 a year earlier. Elected officials and others have worked for several years to find a solution. Let us hope that they can find some sort of middle ground on this, because I'm quite sure that not everyone's going to win on this. And on that note, it's case dismissed for today's Lawsuits Across America. And, Jay, have you got that soundbite I requested yesterday? Y yes, I have that soundbite for you. Why don't you go ahead, take it Wonderful, away. thank you. And, and this, of course, this first story happens to relate to yesterday's announcement that Full House is being rebooted as Fuller House. Just how full is the house and just how well are the actors and actresses reacting? Well, listen to this. Prophecy. We had booked Lori Laughlin here to talk about One Calls the Heart, That's the fabulous true. Hallmark thing. We'll get to that, all of that. Yesterday, your phone blows up. Last night, I get a text from a good friend of mine, and he says, please, please tell me this is true. And I click on the link, and it deadlines breaking the story. John Stamos says, Full House Reunion is a go. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I have no deal. Oh. Dave Coulier has no deal. Bob Saget doesn't have a deal. So I think what happened was... They negotiated with the girls to do a spinoff for Candace Cameron, Jodie Sweetin, and Andrea Barber. And then they decided they wanted to do a reunion show. They then prematurely announced a reunion show without having all of our deals in place. Oh. And I will say this. We are all up. We love each other. We are all up for coming back. The only thing is they have reached out. They have to be fair to all of us with these deals. And right now, they're not being fair to some of us. And I think if they're not fair to all of us, a few of us will not be coming back. So it's the ball, the ball is in their court. We are happy to be there. We love each other. But we're gonna we're putting it back on them. They have to step up and be fair to everyone. All right, let's negotiate. No, it's the right thing to no, do. No, but you know what? Let's we're gonna negotiate this now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's what you're <laughs> saying. Here's Sam. here's in essence what you're saying. We want the friends arrangement. 
Yeah, Everybody exactly. gets the same. Exactly. So the gals who are coming back full time, that's the full time thing. Right. And you want the per episode rate they're getting. Well, we want, we just yeah. want whatever their, whatever, whatever John, let's say, let's start with John. John, okay. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go from there. Okay. And then and I think we'll, it, we'll, Perfect. we'll all be good. It has to happen. I, the, I would hope so. I would hope the world would, requires I would hope it. That, I mean, listen, my Twitter's blowing up. People are like, please, yeah. you've got to come back. You've got to come back. And so, I, and like I said, we, I would love to. I know Dave would love to, but we just, it has to all be, it's got to be fair. Got to be fair. Well, Lori said it quite clearly there, Corey Evan. She wants a fair deal, and she wants her fellow actors there to get a fair deal as well. Yes, so otherwise they're all going to be shouting, Ah, Bob said! And the Saget has disappeared, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see what happens. All right, Corey, we have just enough time for one more story before we wrap up tonight's yes. program. Yeah, People Magazine has named Sandra Bullock as the world's most beautiful woman for 2015. Oh, Not just in Hollywood, hell, but yeah. No. The, yeah, I know, really? right? Really? Yes, that's what it says right here, at least. The 50 year old actress who voices a supervillain in the upcoming movie Minions tops the magazine's list announced Wednesday. <clears throat> Commenting on being selected for this year's cover, Bullock says she just laughed when she heard about the honor. Quote, no, really, I just said, that's ridiculous, she tells one magazine. She tells People magazine, that is. I've told no one, unquote. Despite her long roster of accomplishments, the role that Bullock cherishes the most is being a mom to her five-year-old son, Lewis. At least that's what she says. And, of course, that, that comes to us from Fox News, the AP, and People magazine. Thanks a lot for bringing us... What Jay at least has detected is more BS because it's baloney. It doesn't even make any sense. Exactly, so and to me, my fiance Jennifer is the most beautiful in the world. Ooh. At least I better say that, otherwise she'll oh. kill me. But it is yeah, true in my say eyes. That, ladies and gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen, the reason Corey is saying that and being very careful what he says is because whatever is said on this program tonight can be repeated on Sackheads Radio coming up at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, right here on the SHR Media Network. Uh, yeah, go that, ahead and repeat it at nauseum, Sackheads. Absolutely right. On that note, folks, that is the Evan Miller Report for this Wednesday, April the 22nd, 2015. I'm Jason Miller for Corey Evan and all of us here at SHR. We wish you a good evening. Coming up next is the weather with Chris Fox from the BBC Met Office. We wish you a great night, everybody. Let's uh, look at the forecast now for the United States. And the satellite picture shows uh, a few big thunderstorms beginning to develop. Uh, there could be a few severe ones actually across Texas and Oklahoma as we head through Wednesday evening and overnight as well. By Thursday, the risk of really heavy downpours will be working down towards the Florida panhandle where the main threat from these storms will be from torrential falls of rain. So there is a risk of some local surface water flooding issues. It's still pretty cold and cloudy across the northeast of the United States and eastern Canada. The area of low pressure that we've had here for much of the week still leaving its legacy of cool air and northwesterly winds. And across the Pacific Northwest, an unsettled day with showers. A cool day as well in Vancouver at just 46 degrees Fahrenheit. Not the toastiest of spring days here. Further south, well, cloud beginning to melt away for coastal parts of California, so a little bit more brightness getting through. Well, we've talked about those severe storms bringing a risk of some localised surface water flooding across Florida. Just to the north of this, staying quite cloudy across north and south Carolina and Georgia, although there will be occasional brighter spells here. Cloudy weather for the northeast of the U.S. with a cold northwesterly breeze. But over the next few days, as that cloud begins to break up, we should start to see more sunshine, and that will begin to lift the temperatures, for example, into New York. Highs of 57 here by Saturday. The Pacific Northwest sees further showers Friday and Saturday, so it stays rather unsettled. A bit more sunshine, though, for L.A. by Saturday.
Conservative media done right. You're listening to the SHR Media Network.